Hey guys, how's everyone doing today? Uh, come on, it's 11.30, you had two sessions already to wake up. We're in prime time Friday sessions now. Um, welcome, thanks for coming along to OFS 308. My name's Yoni Kirsch, I'm an office deployment geek from Fast Track Technology. Um, we spend most of our time consulting enterprises and government organisations about office and Windows deployment and compatibility and that kind of thing. There we go, that's me. Um, <coughs> so, what have we got in the agenda for today? Um, I, was, I was asked to present this session on office deployment and compatibility and having been to a bunch of sessions uh, on similar topics at, at other conferences and, and at this one, I found that you hear a lot of the same content, here's OMPM, here's what it does, here's OEAT, here's what it does, here's OCCI. All right, we've got tools, 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 tools. But what I never seem to hear coming out of anyone's mouth is when we should use the tools and when not to use the tools. And if we are going to use the tools, how should we use them and how can we get the most out of them? So that's really what I'm going to try and focus on today is rather than just give you a slab full of demos of here's how each of the four four letter acronym uh, office compatibility tools work and here's how you should deploy it and here's how to use the office customization tool. Um, I'm, I, I, what I'm trying to, to, to achieve today is to give you a bit of, uh, a, of insight into what's worked for us, where the tools have been effective and where they haven't, but more importantly what can you take away with this in terms of process to actually get on, get from where you are now um, to having a successful Office 2010 deployment completed with the least amount of fuss and user effort in the meantime. So, a um, couple of bits of housekeeping first up. Can I just get everyone to turn their phones like up to the maximum possible ring volume? Just that way when they go off in the middle of the session, you know, I'll, I'll know exactly who to point the ridicule at. Um, beyond that, I, I, I really hate standing up here and just speaking to you for a whole 75 minutes. So. I would absolutely love it if you interrupted me every five minutes along the way and threw questions at me because at least that way I know that I can, I can uh, deliver some content that will be of value to you and that you'll get what you need to out of this session. So, start off with a quick show of hands. Can, can I get you to put your hands up quickly? Who in the room is working for an organisation that runs Office 2010 across their fleet today? One, two, three, who didn't put their hands up? Okay, so we've got a couple. I'd be interested to know what you're doing here. You've already done the job. Um, but hey, welcome anyway. Who's, um, who's running Office 2007 across the board? Wow. Okay, that's really cool. You're like, you've, good news for you guys. And 2003? Okay, about the other half of the room. And anyone something ghastly before 2003? No one. All right, good. No one will admit it, exactly. Um, another bit of housekeeping quickly, if you want to ask questions, you absolutely put them up, otherwise you can flick them through on Twitter and monitoring the tw Twitter feed so we can answer them as we go along as well. So all right, so we've got half a room full of people who are on Office 2007 and half a room full of people who are on Office 2003 and a couple on 2010. So of the people in the room who are on 2003, where, someone, someone jump up quickly and tell me, where do you think your biggest challenges are going to lie in getting yourself up to 2010? User training, okay. Who said access databases? Right, okay. Anything else? Custom VBA macros. Custom VBA macros, okay. That's a good one. Do we have any more 2003? Like file versions? Okay. All right, so the big things that I'm hearing here are user education and training. Sorry, I don't have too much content on that one today. Um, but I'm hearing a lot of, okay, file discrepancies. We've got, you know, previous uh, binary 2003 file format um, to OpenXML docx type format issues. Um, VBA code inside uh, uh, documents. Um, plugins. Fantastic. All right. Plugins. So, um, and uh, specifically when you talk about plugins, what kind of stuff are you talking about? Enterprise vault, uh, communicator, link, all, all those sorts of 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you've, you've, you've just drawn out two really contrasting examples there. So Enterprise Vault has actual registered plugins that go and they put themselves into the, into the, the registry keys for Excel or Word or whatever it is, and they say, hey, look at me. I'm an Office add-in. Everybody come and find me. Here I am being an Office add-in, right? Then you've got Link. Link interacts with Office all the time, right? But is Link actually an Office add-in? No. Does Link register itself as an Office add-in? No. So how do you identify that, and how do you find it? So that's, that's really good that you pulled out two contrasting things there. So similarly, you have a whole bunch of issues with file fidelity as well, where you have that disparate um, types of issues, and how can you combine all the information together to look at a whole picture? So um, maybe, maybe we should start off by looking at some add-in compatibility stuff. So, can I get a show of hands in the room? Who has used, uh, uh, up until now, the OEAT, or the Office Environment Assessment Tool? You don't count. We have one person. Did you get any good results out of it? Yeah? It takes, takes a long time. How many computers did you scan? Uh, 800. And how did you deploy it? SCCM, OK. So, so, for those of you in the room who haven't used the tool before, Actually, have a slide here. Might be helpful. Look at me being unprepared. I don't even know where the clicker is. Yeah, we know why we're here. We've spoken about the agenda already today. Bear with me. I'm just going to jump forward here because we're going straight to OEAT. All right. So, the Office Environment Assessment Tool is a uh, a single-use or um, uh, enterprise deployable Office compatibility tool aimed at giving you a bit more visibility on uh, what software you have out there in your environment that is interacting with Office. So that includes applications that are Office plugins. So for example, Adobe Acrobat, where you end up with a menu bar inside Office. Um, or conversely, applications that use the Office Com APIs to do whatever, create a spreadsheet, uh, write an email or whatever, but don't actually register themselves as an Office add-in. So um, the OEAT is going to help you identify both of those scenarios. <laughs> what is it actually going to tell you in terms of compatibility? Not a huge amount. So that's probably the biggest challenge here. And why you can see what I've done here is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to point out that, yeah, OK, we've got this tool. How does it work? We start off. We get our client computers, we deploy a, 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 an agent to them, the agent scans them, it monitors the, the registry keys that have the locators for the, the Office Com APIs, it finds anything that's going looking for the Office Com API and records it in a big list, sends all that information back through the scanner to XML files on a centralised location. They all then get compiled by the OEAT compiler and they end up in a big, fat Excel spreadsheet that you'll see in a second. Now, did we actually achieve anything at this stage? <laughs> Not necessarily, right? All you know now is, OK, I've got 655 computers that have Snagit on them, and I've got 280 computers that have Link installed and another 300 that have Office Communicator. Good contextual information, and you may very well need to run this tool to get that kind of information out of it. But the first thing I'll say is, don't rely on this tool to solve all of your add-in compatibility issues when you upgrade to Office 2010. The good news is that most of them will resolve themselves with new versions and all that kind of stuff. But understand what the question is that you're asking before you go and invest the time to run this tool. If, if we look at the example here, you've you know, gone off and scanned 800 odd computers through SCCM. It's a bit of a time and investment to get that set up correctly. Um, it certainly doesn't work as out of the box doing it like that. So um, the, the consideration is just use, use this tool as something to help you identify what is out there, to help you identify how many copies of it, and to help you actually track down, oh, well, it says it's called Snagit, and I'll go and look, oh, look, it's in C program files slash Snagit, so we know what it is. Now, something that... Um, Something that we've had some success with in the past 
is combining this data with other data sources because then all of a sudden you're contextualizing it and you might get something more valuable out of the information if you can compare it with what you've already been working on uh, elsewhere. So I suppose, tell me, show of hands, who in the room is deploying Windows 7 around the same time frame as Office 2010? Right? I'm going to go out there and say that's about 80% of the room. So who's already started working on their Windows 7 deployment as well? Right? Pretty much the same group of people. Keep your hands up if you've used the application compatibility toolkit and pushed that package out to start collecting data from your, from your clients. Okay, about half of you. And the rest of you who are working on Windows 7, do you know what that tool is? General nods in the room. Okay, so the application compatibility toolkit on the Windows side of things, and it's a similar uh, concept. You push a client out, it collects information, sends it back, ends up in a big SQL database that you can query and you can figure out. In fact, I'll get it out and I'll show it to you. We all see that okay? Should be able to, yeah, I don't have Zoom it turned on. Excuse me a second. Just changed logons here at the last minute. Okay, there we go. So, for those of you who don't know, this is the application compatibility manager. And from here, what you can do is, once you've collected all your information back, you can go through and start categorizing your applications. You can say, all right, these 10 here, I'm going to set a category on them, and I want to say, all right, they're all custom software or something like that. And for those of you using it already, you've probably started to put some logic and put some effort into reducing that number down. The um, example database I've got here, I think, has something in the vicinity of 16,000 software titles on there. Now, most of them are either updates or they're copies of the same thing, 27 versions of Adobe Flash Reader or Player or whatever. Um, but you might have invested already in starting to cull that list down. So what I would like to show you now is a way that you can, with not too much additional effort, use the data that you get out of your OEAT report to contextualize the information that you've got in ACT. Now, am I saying that this is the one holy grail thing that you can do to make your, uh, you know, your, your, your OEAT data useful? No. What I'm trying to do here is trying to give you some ideas as to um, how you can develop your own process that will add value to your situation. So, let's see how that looks. So, for the purposes of demonstration here, I'm just going to insert a, a filter here. If you've, if you've seen before, we can, we can add these filters on. And what I've done is I've, I've gone ahead and created a number of categories. And the top category I've created is called Office Add-ins. And then if you have a look, I've also created, uh, I've created categories for, for Word Add-ins, for Excel Add-ins, for PowerPoint Add-ins, Outlook and other. So, if we, if we make a filter here that says, I only want to see the applications that have a category where the category name is Office Add-ins. We execute that, we can see we've got absolutely nothing there. So, if I jump into my OEAT report, so hands up if you have an OEAT report that looks something like this. No? How, how hands up if you have an OEAT report that looks something several hundred lines longer? Probably. Um, is there any value, would anyone like, to, like me to demonstrate how to create an OEAT report before we go into this? Is, can I get a show of hands if you want me to show you that? Otherwise, I'll just skip over it. All right, I'll skip over it. Um, we did demonstrate it this morning in OFS 204 if you were at that. So otherwise, you could maybe download that if you wanted to have a look. So what have I done? I've got a little bit of VBA that I've written here in, in about half an hour last week. And if I press this button here, you can see that it's worked away for about five seconds. And if we come back into the App Compat Manager and re-execute this query, look at that. All of a sudden, we've got stuff turning up in our App Compat Manager that's been registered as a Office add-in. 
Now, if I, for example, change this and said, I only want to see stuff that's a word add-in. You can see I've got, it's kind of a bit hard to see on Word. Maybe I'll show you Outlook. Oh, PowerPoint, surely something has a shorter list. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you can see, it. yeah, there you go. PowerPoint's a bit of a bit of a shorter one there. So, all of a sudden, we've taken some fairly dry data out of our OEAT report. I mean, essentially all you've got here is you've got a couple of partial matches and that really just says that, hey, this is a Microsoft thing because we're the only people who ever wrote anything into this database. Um, OEAT went and checked that against a web service, but in my experience, we, we've got um, OEAT reports that have come back with thousands of, of line items on them and generally speaking, you don't get any useful information out of that match or partial match. All it's really telling you is, this application was found in a database, it's a real thing, we know it exists. So, the App Compat Manager, however, has a lot more information in it. And all of a sudden, if you're already using this to do your, uh, your, your Windows application compatibility, do you have a question? No? Um, to do your Windows application compatibility, then something like this will start to contextualize that for you. <coughs> so, how do we do that? Is there anyone in the room who uh, does want to have a look at how I pulled that together? Yes? Yes, okay, no worries. I'll give you a quick run through for it. For those of you who aren't interested in the code side of things, I will try not to stay on it for too long. All right. So, give me a second here. Oh, it's not going to work. Can we, can, can we read that code off the screen there, guys? Yeah? All right. So this one's fairly simple. Do a bit from each side. Basically, all I've done is I've created a, a SQL connection there, and I've told it to fetch the um, SQL server name and the, the database out of my config sheet in the database. Uh, sorry, actually, we grabbed them. Looking at the wrong one. Who's going to call me on that? struggling with the, um, the resolution here. There it is. That's better. All right. So in this one, what we've done is we've grabbed the, the SQL connection string, and we're taking the spreadsheet that has all the OEAT information in it and reading it out into an array. So we're adding each line into, into the array, and then splitting it all out that way. Then, basically what we do is we call our sub down here, and that's looking back at this field here in the OEAT report that says this is a Word or an Excel or a PowerPoint or whatever it is, right? And so we look at that and we say if it's Word, then this is what the subcategory is, and if it's Outlook, so on and so forth. So we take the response of that from the subcategory, and then we call our uh, we call our other function here that writes it into the database, which is down the bottom here. And then all that does is it opens the SQL connection again to write with, and it inserts the category values into the categorized applications table in the database that says, okay, the category is office add-ins, the subcategory is word add-ins go off and do it. And so what you end up with is, if we just come back over here, I just, I just have a, another piece of code that I have that removes everything. So if we look there, we've got nothing. And then all we do is come back into our function here, up the top, and run it. Takes about five seconds. And there we go. Anyone think something like that might be useful to them in their Office 2010 deployment? Yeah? Can you think of anything else that you might want to pull out of OEAT 
and, and, and move to another data source. That for me was really the big one. ACT has a lot more community data about um, you know, what software works with Windows 7, what software works with other pieces of software and where the incompatibility lies. And there's, it, it, back when they launched Windows 7, there was nothing in there. You'd go in and you'd, you'd synchronize your ACT database and you'd end up with absolutely nothing. Now, you go in there and pretty much everything you find has you know, 60, 70 community comments on it. So for me, it was a good way to contextualize some of that information. Does that, anyone have any questions about OEAT or add-on compatibility and how that uh, fits into their, their office deployment before we move on? Nothing? All right. No problems at all. So I had a couple of other challenges that um, people identified when I asked earlier in the session. Some of them were around um, getting the silent deployments ready um, and how, how to push it out, what are the different deployment options. But a big one that came up a whole bunch of times was around file compatibility. Which files do we have that are going to work in OpenXML format? Which files don't we have? Now, considering that half of the room are already on 2007, the news is pretty good. If you've got your, if your whole organization is already running Office 2007, the, the step change from a file format point of view is almost negligible. So if you're looking to go and start running tools like OMP, yeah, what's up? Uh, with regards to that, what about if you're running Office 2007 and if you cater for people who aren't at Office 2007, you could bring policy stuff in to run in compatibility mode. mode. Yes, okay, that's a very good question. So the question was, what if you're running Office 2007, but to cater for your transition period, you've put Office 2007 into compatibility mode, which means that it opens and saves documents using... <laughs> Paul's shaking his head. Um, look, the, the, the answer to your question is that for you, your documents are probably all sitting in a doc format. So you now have another decision to make when you move to Office 2010, um, you know, do you want to continue with your documents? Are you going to start aggressively migrating all of your documents to a docx format? Are you going to leave the ones that are currently doc as doc files and then turn off compatibility mode so that new files come on as a, a with open XML formats? So let's talk about that for a second. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, that is a very good point. They are, that's one of the only ones, in fact, that's changed. Um, so the, the comment was that uh, Project has a different file format between 2007 and 2010. Have, have you found any major compatibility issues when you've moved? Um, it complains. Um, so if, if you take a 2010, like somebody opens a project file that was 2007 and 2010, mm -hmm. and they save it, um, the 2007 people can no longer open it. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. that aren't going to work even if you, yeah. And that's one of the challenges that you'll find, and probably OMPM is something that might help you at least find some of those files. Another big one is access databases. I can't remember who it was who brought up access databases. So um, access is one of those things that the formats change so many times that the scenario for each different format is different as, is the, yeah, the scenario for each format is different, and what you need to do about it is different. It's also, if you consider um, of the 50, errors that the OMPM is capable of um, detecting and considering that each error only relates to one Office product, 11 of them are access. So, you know, 10% 10, 10 of the Office products account for 20% of the errors. It's, it, it probably tells you something there. Um, the, the biggest challenge that we see is people say, okay, well, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll go and we'll download OMPM or we'll bring in a consultant to run OMPM for us. We'll run it across all of our file servers. We've got 50 sites, got 50 file servers. We'll 
kick off a project to run OMP against everything, and that will tell us what all the problems are going to be, and then we'll trot off and fix them. It's never going to happen. Can anyone have a guess? If you, for every gigabyte of standard general business office documents, someone put your hand up and tell me how many errors you could expect to see out of a terabyte of data. Anyone? Have a guess. Say you have a million files. How many of them are going to have errors in them? Geez, you've got some really nice office environments. On average, for every million files, you will have approximately 150,000 of them that OMPM will pick up some kind of problem with. Now, what do all those problems mean? Well, most of them, not much. You've got a lot of issues that say something along the lines of embedded documents in this file. What's wrong with having an embedded document in a file? Someone tell me what happens if you take a Word document that has another Word document embedded in it, you open it with Office 2010, and then you hit the Save button and say DocX. Someone take a guess. No, nothing. It works perfectly. There's absolutely no problem with having an embedded document in a file. It's just that OMPM can't actually scan the embedded document. It can only scan the document that it scanned. And so it throws an error at you saying, hey, look, I can't, I can't scan this document, so here's an error. So for the people that we've worked with that have gone off and run OMPM and then looked at the results that have come out the other side of it and said, hey, we just spent weeks doing this and it didn't actually tell us anything. So, what I've um, spent a lot of time working on is how can we, what, what are the questions that we actually need to ask? And for me, the default reporting is, is, is not really getting to, them, getting to them. So for me, some of the biggest questions that you need to ask is, okay, how many documents do I have, period? Two, how many of the documents that I have will have a problem when we open them and save them in their old format using Office 2010. Because let's face it, you're probably not going to do an aggressive migration of Office 2010 files. I mean, there's a tool there that plugs into OMPM, the Office File Converter, or OFC. You could say, hey, look, here's all my files. Take all the ones that had a green status or above that should be good, like, and just convert them all to docx. So great. We halved our file size. Well, no, you didn't. You added 50% to the file size on your servers because now you've got all these doc files plus a whole bunch of docx files as well. So unless you manage that properly, and then out of those, how many are you going to end up fixing because they didn't convert properly in an automated fashion? For me, it's almost a no-brainer that you'd leave the files that you already had in the binary formats in the binary formats, and then you put policy in place to put new, format, new files into the new format. In a scenario like yours, um, you're now on 2007, so when you go to 2010, you should easily be able to do that, because as people transition off, the people who haven't transitioned yet are still on 2007. Those of you who are on 2003, you know there's a compatibility pack that you can load up onto 2003 ahead of time that will allow those users to open docx files. I'm probably telling you how to suck eggs. You've more than likely deployed it anyway. 2003 people, who's deployed the Office compatibility pack? I'd say that's all the 2003 people. Oh, sorry, 2003 people who hasn't deployed the compatibility pack? No one. OK, there you go. That was a better question. Um, so yeah, so if you're not going to go and do an aggressive file conversion like that, then why do you really care at this stage if you're going to have files that have problems when you go to save them as a docx file? You're not going to aggressively convert them. If you've got people opening document files one by one, hey, look, here's my file, I'm working on it. Oh, I actually want to change this and save it as a docx file. They've made an active choice to go and click the Save As button and change the file format, then go and delete their old one. So they probably are going to expect that something might happen a little bit differently, and then you deal with those situations one at a time. If you tried to address all of those situations before they happened, you'd never get anywhere. You'd sit there, you'd, spend, you'd have to look at 150,000 files for every million that you have. And I mean, who in the room has data in your organization that exceeds a terabyte? Two terabytes, keep your hands up. Three terabytes, keep your hands up. Five terabytes, keep your hands up. We've still got people. Ten terabytes. All right, 20 terabytes. Anybody? Oh, over there, okay. Let's have a big one. 50 terabytes. 
Oh, okay, so we've got people in the room who've got potentially 50 terabytes of data, or somewhere between 5 and 50, and so you're talking about something in the vicinity of maybe a couple of million files that OMPM would find an error with. So by the time you spent three months trying to scan all of that, another six months importing it into the SQL database so you could analyze it, and then the rest of your life analyzing it, you'd never upgrade. So for me, it's really about, okay, well, let's ignore everything that isn't going to cause a problem to be opened. The only things that, w that I really, now you might be different, but the only things I want to be concerned with is what is going to cause data loss? So an example of data loss might be um, if you have a Word document that someone has used the Office 2003 versions uh, functionality in and they keep, kept all their important revisions inside previous versions in Office 2000, inside the binary file format, what you end up with is a container doc file with a whole bunch of little doc files hiding underneath it. So, and they're kind of binary difference doc files. Um, in that case, if you open that file and save it with Word 2010, regardless of the file format, gone. All of the versions are gone. So for me, it's probably one of the more mundane examples, but it's an example nonetheless where you have uh, uh, office documents that you'll have data loss when you open or save them using uh, Office 2010. There's a, there's a similar functionality with um, uh, some broadcast data in, in PowerPoint. And if you want to look at more of the uh, errors in depth, we're in the process of developing some new documentation that's going to go up on TechNet. Um, has anyone looked at the OMPM error documentation on TechNet? What, what's up there? A big table with a couple of words on every error. Document contains versions. Yeah. So um, we're working on some new stuff at the moment. It's in content review, and that's going to go up on TechNet. And you'll have kind of you know, a couple of pages on each error. And I think that's probably the first step. If you're going to use these tools in the first place, use them with the expectation of looking at what comes out of them afterwards and saying, all right, well, we've got 50 errors that they've picked up on. Or maybe out of the 50, you've got 30 examples in your environment. I only care about five of these. That's really the big important step to actually getting something done. Because like I said, otherwise you'll be here all year. So <clears throat> once you've done that, um, if you try and look at this kind of stuff in, the, in the, the standard OMPM report viewer, you'll find that all it's going to say is, here's a list of your files and here's what errors they've got. Has anyone looked at the access errors section in OMPM? Not yet? Prepare, make sure you're sitting down when you do it. So you end up with a whole bunch of useless information, basically. So what I've started to do is to try and ask myself, what are the questions that you really need answered? So, OK, first of all, what are the errors we really care about? Number two, what kind of files are we likely to come across that have the most errors in them? So, OK, I've got a million documents. They're broken up in this, 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 and this. How many of my errors relate to access? And how many of my errors relate to Excel and how many relate to Word. Why am I asking that question? I'm asking that question because it affects the outcome of what I'm actually going to achieve with OMPM. Can anyone tell me something that you, an action you might take based on scanning all your files and finding out what errors they have in them? No one? Would you maybe go and fix them all? Probably not. For me, the kind of actions that I see people taking off this kind of data tends to be things along the lines of, I need to hire more VBA developers to fix these problems. Or, OK, we found all these issues. Most of them relate to access. So let's hire an extra access guy to sit on the help desk during our deployment so if any problems do come up, he can fix them rather than saying, OK, well, we've got 3,000 access databases. Somebody needs to go and sit down and look at each one of them. What are you going to do? You're going to be there all year, and 90% of them would have been OK. So I can't drive it home enough that if you're going to use the tools, then know what the question is before you go looking for the answer. Did anyone go to Chris Jackson's Windows App Compat sessions yesterday? A few people. So 
Chris, Chris has a really interesting way of putting app combat questions and troubleshooting in general is that, you know, um, hypothesis tool, hypothesis tool. So rather than just saying, okay, I've got these four tools, what information can I find out of them? It's, all right, what's the question? All right, I know what the question is. How many VBA programmers am I going to need? All right, what's the answer? Well, now we can go and ask a question of the tool we're going to get a specific answer. We know that we can find out how many files we have uh, in our environment that have VBA in them using OMPM. So we'll run OMPM and, uh, and we'll, we'll get the answer to that question. So it's, you can see it's a much more linear approach in that you've got a list of questions. We want to know how many of this type of person we need, how many of that type, and what actions we have to take and how likely are we to come across problems as we go rather than let's just go out and fix everything. So the OMPM, this, I, I actually had a good chuckle to myself developing this slide because I have an opinion about um, the format that this tool takes. I, I, inside the office deployment circles, there's a lot of um, uh, jokes and whatnot that get thrown around about the tool and why is it so many different tools rolled into one. At the end of the day, this is the tool. This is what it is, and we've got to get the most out of it, essentially. So what do we have? We have an OMPM scanner that is a command line scanner configurable with an any file. Um, and it goes off and it scans your data stores, brings everything back, and sticks it into XML files that it compresses down into CAB files. Um, to give you an idea, for every terabyte of file stores that you scan with this thing, it'll probably take about six or seven hours oh, per terabyte, yeah, about six or seven hours, and it'll probably produce about a gigabyte of compressed XML files. So what do you do with those? You import them into a SQL database using the OMPM import tool, another command line tool. It's a batch file, actually, that calls a WSF script that references some VB, um, which all ends up in a SQL database. Then we have the Microsoft Access Report Viewer that you can use to, uh, to, to look at that information. Is anyone interested in seeing me do a five minute run through on how, how that process works and how to, how to use the OMPM tool? Yeah? You have one or two? All right. Just have to quickly make a, a network change to be able to do that. This is all off the cuff because I didn't actually have that demo prepared. Give me a second. Okay, so I try and run through this quickly. I know it's, it's, it's fairly dry into it in itself. So on this server here, we should have a OMPM folder. And you can see here, we've got an offscan.exe and offscan.e. This is the configuration file for the OMPM scanner. So we've got a run ID up the top. Here's where we want to store our uh, our, our uh, scan cab files, and then a whole bunch of settings, whether we want to do deep scans, and I won't go into it all now. You can read TechNet if you're really that interested. And then down the bottom, here's where we want to scan our files. Okay, so, actually, I did want to do that, sorry. Just need to change that run idea or it's not going to run. So now all you do is you just kick off off scan.exe the OMPM scan is going to run. It's going to take a few minutes to do that scan, so I'll, I'll kill it. Once it finishes, you'll end up with a bunch of files that look like this. There they are. I'll just move them into there, because these ones have already been imported in a demo I did this morning. So now, we go into the database folder. We just create a database here on POC. So you just specify the name of your server there, the name of your SQL instance, and then we'll call the 
OFS 308. Okay, and OMPM now creates that database. We now just import the... I might just copy all this stuff here to make life easier. And our files are in OMPM scan samples. There they are. And there you go. OMPM is now importing the CAB files into the database and it'll go off and finish that in the next couple of minutes. And it's done. So, I can tell you right now this bit's going to error at us because, like I said, I haven't reset my demo from this morning. Hopefully it goes okay. So this is the access uh, front-end viewer for the information that lives in the SQL database. And you see here, I think we called it OFS 308. OFS. So we should be able to connect to that database now. And we can go inside here and we can say, okay, look, we've got these different types of issues. It's found some things that have file formats prior to Excel, 97, so on and so forth. Uh, and then also information about the computers that were involved in the scan and all these files. However, you probably agree a lot of this data is fairly unwieldy in this format. Um, the other thing that uh, is probably relevant to our access friend over here is uh, you know you can sit here and you've got to run all these scans to analyze the uh, access reports and then okay here's all the databases and here's all the issues that they had or didn't have this one was a link table right that's got link tables in it from one database to the other that's a problem well I don't know why um, the only issue with that is that if your link was broken before it'll still be broken afterwards okay <laughs> anyway, so, um, so anyway, that, that gives you a bit of an idea of how the OMPM scanner itself looks. I'm just going to jump off there now. Switch my networks back over here. So, here's something that... Am I going for time? Excuse me, guys. So we had 11, 30, 12, 30. All right, cool. We've got a bit of time left. So here's one that, um, that I created to try and get a, answer a few more of those questions that you really want to know the answer to without having to trawl through that horrible access database interface. So here's a bit of information about, OK, and just give me a second here. I'm, you know, I'll leave it there for the moment. Here's a total number of files. We have. 200,000 files, look at that, 186,000 of them have issues, and the rest don't. Pretty, it's not particularly useful data yet, right? So, um, and here's the ones that were file scan errors, and then we can look through and we can say, all right, out of all the red issues, most of the problems were documents that contained versions, and we spoke about that earlier. So, all right, now we're starting to see some more contextualized data about what those errors actually mean. Great. In here... You can see I've, I've put some, I've kind of removed some of the text from this because this is something that some of our customers pay for, so we don't want to give too much of it away in here. But you can see here we, we can then put more information about each of the errors, and all of a sudden you're starting to produce a report really quickly that um, you, know, you can hand to someone and it will actually add value to them. They can say, all right, well, here's the type of issues. Most of them aren't a problem. Here's the ones that I need to care about. And most importantly, now I can make some kind of a decision as to what we're going to do that will enable us to move forward. So yeah, so that's what we're trying to achieve there. So the other really interesting section in here is um, this one here that I called out earlier, which is talking about the file formats. And so you can see all of a sudden, all right, well, look at that. Funny thing, of all of our errors, 88% of them are relating to PowerPoint. Hmm. In this case, it's an error that you might not care about. Once you've culled it down, those numbers will change. But say, for example, it was the case that for some reason, someone had gone and created all these abnormal templates in PowerPoint that all your staff are using. And then you could say, all right, well, now I know that we need some more PowerPoint skills in-house when we do this migration so that we can, we, can, we can actually get the thing done. 
rather than saying, all right, well, I know that I have you know, half a million PowerPoint um, uh, issues that I need to resolve. So, how did we get there? You can see here what I've done is I've just removed all the content out of this. <clears throat> Once again, I've made myself a magic little button. And away it goes. And if we go back and have a look at it, it's gone and filled everything in off a database that has OMPM information in it. Now, once again, am I trying to say to you, okay, what you all need to do, the call to action now at the back of this session is to go back, make yourself a, a big spreadsheet that looks exactly like this and write some code that looks exactly like mine to you know, figure out nice graphs of where all your PowerPoint issues are. No, I'm just again trying to get you thinking, well, what are the questions that are important to me? What are the questions that are important to you? For you, they might be different to your questions. You know, you might need to act actively go and fix a whole bunch of VBA code where you might need to bring some more people on board to help your service desk guys. So all I'm trying to get to here is what I've done here is I knew before I started what the question was. And now I've tried to answer it. Anyone want to have a look at how I did that? Yeah, a couple of hands up. All right. So once again, um, for those of you who can, who can read VB, it's fairly straightforward code. All I've done is I've grabbed the, um, I've grabbed the, the data of uh, which, which SQL server to connect to out of that field and that field. So you can just change it there and point it at a new server. And then I run queries straight out of the SQL database that says, give me all the issues from OMPM issues where the document type was PowerPoint and boom, chucked it into that cell. And it's as easy as that. There's nothing more, there's nothing more to it. Um, if you want any of these code samples to use back in your office, then I'm um, more than happy to share them with you. You can just uh, chuck me an email or I, I can, I've actually put most of the code into the slide decks as well in the notes section, so you should be able to grab it out of there. So yeah, so that was how I did that. And that's probably all I've got to talk about compatibility side of things for this morning. Is there anything that's come up that people think should be addressed or we should talk some more about in terms of either file or, or document compatibility? No? All right, great. Let's move on to the fun stuff. So <clears throat> for the rest of the session, what I wanted to do was um, go through a couple of different options for deploying Office 2010. I know we had a couple of guys down the front here who were, who were asking about that. So um, I wanted to look at a couple of options as to how you can customize what you push out there onto people's desktops. And also, I wanted to address a scenario that's been glossed over a whole bunch, in my opinion, over the last few um, tech ed conferences, which is app V deployment. Has anyone in the room considered doing an Office 2010 app V deployment? Anyone in the room actually done a production app V deployment? You have, of 2010? What did you do? Why, why did you do an app V deployment? Right, okay. Uh, but uh, I should say, say that up front. But actually, I think it's a, it's a great tool for helping make off the latest version of Office available very quickly. Right? Uh, and yep. I don't have to patch and update it. It's always the latest and greatest version, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows me, if I need to, for a demo or for whatever reason, I can run two copies of Office side by side, and they don't interfere with each other, which is really useful. Which we're going to do in a minute. Exactly. So, thank you very much for pointing that. And you did an Office app V deployment as well. And what we—that was the nature of your your um, your test. You weren't you didn't have a scenario in mind for it. I think you've yeah. Okay. Excel, that kind of thing. Yep. Okay. So that, those for me are the really two good scenarios for Office 2010 with App V. So the first one is for doing pilots and demos and proof of concepts. But more importantly than that, being able to get the latest and greatest Office out onto people's desktops in a timely fashion. We have a customer that we're working with at the moment. They've got eight sites, hundreds of seats, and they've got a whole bunch of users, and they're not sure 
how their users are going to go adapting to 2010. They're on 2003 at the moment, and there's been some concern voiced that, hey, what if you come and push this 2010 package out onto all of our computers, and, and we can't work, we can't do what we need to do. So the manager there made a decision, all right, well, why don't we sequence Office 2010 with App V and then push that out alongside their current 2003 environment and then, you know, if, if there's a problem, we say, okay, well, the default file type, we'll set the file associations to 2010. I click on a doc file, it opens in 2010. Hey, Mr. Service Desk guy, my doc file isn't working. I don't understand how to do this thing that I used to be able to do. I can't help you with that right now, but all you need to do is click on your Office 2003 icon that we haven't touched in your start menu, open it up in 2003, and then, then open your file and away you go. So for these guys, it was a really interesting um, uh, opportunity to push 2010 out there, start getting the feedback on it, start getting the user interaction, fully aware of the fact that they might have some add-ins and plugins that aren't going to be able to penetrate that virtualization layer, but at least it gets it out there in the end user's hands and they can start playing with it and using it safe in the knowledge that they've got 2003 there if they need it. The biggest challenge that you'll come across when you do this, in my opinion, is that people have generally changed a whole bunch of settings on their Office 2003 environment, and when you push Office 2010 out to those people, Office 2010 is living inside its little app V or thin app bubble or whatever it is, and none of those settings come across. So now, not only have you pushed out this new software onto everyone's computer, but they don't know how to, they don't have all of their settings brought across with it. So, uh, and this is exactly the challenge that we came across with this customer. They said, well, what's the point in doing this if, we, if people are going to have to set up Office again? So I said, all right, well, if we can sort that out, we'll get Office onto their computer for them. When we come along to do Windows 7 in six months, 12 months' time, whatever your plan is, all right, we're going to build Office 2010 as the default productivity suite into the, into the SOE at that time and then essentially be rid of the App V environment. But in the meantime, at least it's all out there. So the next demo I had, what I wanted to show you is how we can take an Office 2010 App V package, and unfortunately I don't have time in the session to run through the sequencing of uh, doing a complete production Office 2010 sequencing job because it's a, a fairly hefty um, uh, amount of time required to do it, but we can probably go through and have a look at how it came together. Just give me a second, I'll just swap back over to my other network. Shoot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Those flash presentations um, have been updated. Um, for clever reasons that I don't need to explain to you, they remain 2003 yeah. to 2010. They figured if you're on 2007, you can probably handle the transition to 2010. So now those have been updated to 2003 to 2010. Um, there is uh, something that we've seen done quite successfully is putting those into um, as a button inside the ribbon of Office 2010 on the home screen, on the home tab, and then you tell users if you're not sure about something, you just click on this button. And that, to be honest, um, when we were doing Office 2007 migrations in Anger. We did a whole bunch of surveys from big multi-thousand seat productions that we worked on, and the biggest single factor that we could find that affected user adoption, and back me up on this, Paul, if you agree with me, was th those flash guides that say, hey, click here, how do I do file save as on 2003, and it fades out and comes back, and there you go, that's how you do it. Really clever idea on someone's behalf, and we found that to be the single biggest factor that affected user productivity. So definitely go out and get those. Um, let me just pull up one of my machines here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the app V sequence and we're just going to make some changes to a, actually I'm jumping ahead of myself, I'll, I'll open that and leave it to open up. Alright, so while that's happening, yes. Kind of 
So Outlook, funnily enough, is the easiest application in the entire Office suite to get it to migrate your settings because all you need to do is when you sequence Office, don't run Outlook for the first time. Then what happens is when the user runs Outlook in the AppV package for the first time, it pops up and says, oh, I've never run before. Are there any previous versions of Outlook installed? Installed, And then it says, oh, look, on the physical hard drive here, I've got Office 2003, Outlook 2003. I'll migrate the settings. So it picks up all the settings, and it saves them back into the, into the bubble, of the, into the 2003 bubble. I'll show you what, what that looks like. So essentially what you're, what you're trying to achieve there is you've got all your Office 2003 settings here. Then you create an app V package of Office 2010. You, want, you need the app V package to be able to read back to the, the host operating system to get your settings from your various 2003 applications and then put them into the app V package as Office 2010 settings and move them all obviously to the appropriate position. So that way, um, you don't end up with your 2010 settings cluttering, cluttered on the machine. They're all contained within that bubble. You can move them around if you're doing fancy user state stuff with AppV, which is pretty easy to do. Um, and that's, that's essentially what it should look like. So there's a couple of things that we need to do in order to make this work. Shoot. When you do that, does it? Yeah. No, the scenario that I'm talking about, you've got 2003 installed as a local app on the desktop, right. and then you bring an Office 2010 app V package over the top of it. So you have one OSD, and then all the settings end up in the settings PKG file that app V creates each time a new user logs onto the okay. system. I don't follow. The, the OSD for the... The, the, the local cache. Oh, you mean the OFT. Sorry, Sorry I, I thought you were talking... Because the OSD file is the AppV package file. Yeah, no, 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 no. Sorry, you got... So, so what will happen is... Yeah, so you'll end up with one OFT file, um, 2003 version 1 in your local cache, and then the AppV um, Office 2010 instance will copy that into its own private file space right. and, and convert it to 2010. You'll end up with two. Right. Yeah. And so then would the recommendation be that you want to take away Outlook 2003 from them? Um, there's, there, there's no problem with keeping it there. There's two considerations for that. The first is you can't have both of them open at the same time. If you, if you open Outlook 2003 and then open the 2010 one, regardless if it's, if it's in AppV or not, it will come and say to you, hey, you can't run two versions of Outlook at the same time. There's just too much comm stuff that's going to break. Um, and it's the proxy that does it. Um, the second is that if you go back to 2003, any changes that you made in the AppV package won't be... Rep it's you know, one way, setting sync. And so, so long as your users understand that, hey, we're going to migrate all your settings from 2003 the first time you launch Word or Excel or Outlook or whatever, um, but if you go back to using the old ones, then you'll have what was there before. Understanding that, there's no problem. We would generally say, uh, uh, we don't see many people going back to 2003 Outlook anyway. Word, it's normally Word and PowerPoint where it's like, oh, there's this feature that I need that I can't do this thing anymore or whatever. So yeah, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up, and I, I'm sure you've all seen a demo of the Office customization tool before, so I won't go through it from the beginning. But you can see here, the main difference um, with this Office customization tool file um, is that the save location is set to the Q drive so that when we run the app V sequencer, it goes into the right place. Um, and you'll see when you go to do your own app V package that that's just something that makes your life a bit easier. In any case, there's only one thing that we need to change here. Normally, when you install Office 2003, on, uh, sorry, Office 2010, onto a computer that has Office 2003 installed, during the installation process, the installer says, ah, 
Office 2003 used to be on this machine. I'm now deleting Office 2003 so that it's not there over the top of Office 2010, but I need to put a flag somewhere to, to tell Word, for example, that Office 2003 used to be installed here so that when Word fires up for the first time, it knows to go looking for all your Word 2003 settings and migrate them across. The problem that you have with at V is that Word, uh, any Office application, th there's no previous Office 2003 application installed on your at V sequencing computer, so the installer will never set those flags. And then when you launch Word for the first time, it will never run that part of its startup process to migrate all your settings across. So what we need to do is chuck them in manually. So we're going to add some registry keys. To make life easier, I'm going to import them out of here. Look, there they all are. If you want a copy of those, I've put them into the notes in the slide deck, and you can just take my notes and copy them into a reg file and use that. So we put those there, and that's it for that. We save this Office customization tool file, and then we proceed with the sequencing process. Like I said, I can't do the whole sequencing process today. It's just going to take too long. So we proceed with the sequencing process and um, use this Office customization tool file. So when, the, when it completes, the, the Office installation will put those registry files there, and then when Word launches for the first time inside our, uh, inside our uh, host machines under App V, it'll see those flags there and go, OK, I know I need to migrate the settings. Good. There's still a couple of things that we need to do. Hands up if you're familiar with this tool. Uh, only a couple. All right. So this is the App V um, 4.6 Service Pack 1 um, sequencer. There's been a couple of sessions on that already this week. Like I said, I won't go through it in too much detail. But what we just need to do is make a couple of registry changes. Now, so if we have a look in here, what we've got is all the registry settings that are contained within this Office 2010 App V package that we just created while you blinked a second ago. <coughs> and I'll just call out quickly that you'll notice the file, the, the registry settings that we created earlier, Office 14, Common, Migration, and then all these ones are in here saying, hey, look, I used to be version B, language 409, which means 2003 in English. And so, so those are all now included in that app V package, and they'll be able to be seen by Word when it launches up for the first time. Now. There's two other things that we need to do. As part of the App V sequencing process, we needed to launch Word and Excel a whole bunch of times um, to, to, as part of the sequencing process to, to get the primary feature blocks and to do any first run behavior and everything. So what's happened is that action that happens when Word boots up for the first time saying, oh, I need to migrate the settings from Office 2003, it's not going to happen when your users boot Word up for the first time because it already happened in the sequencing process. And Word places a registry key in the current user context saying, OK, I've already done this migration. Don't do it next time I fire up. So what we need to do is quickly come in here, SFT SID, Software, Microsoft, Office 14, Common, Migration. And you guessed it, delete. So OK, now the next time that Word launches up, that key that says, I've already done this migration, it's not there anymore, so you can now launch Word again, and next time it launches, it says, oh, I need to do that migration. Do I have the key here that says that I used to have Office 2003? Yes, I do. Let me go and migrate all the settings. So now I go down to the registry hive called HK Current Users Software Microsoft Office 11, which is where all your um, uh, Office 2003 settings live, and I'll migrate all the settings. Oh, I'm inside an app V package. There's nothing there. I can't see that folder because my because in my app V package it's set to override, and so there's nothing to migrate. Have a good day. Nothing happens. So while we're here, we just need to go back to this office section here, create a new key. It's called new key. Not be able to press F2, having to right click there. Rename it to 
And finally, make sure it already is, but we'll make sure that it's set to merge with local. So what that means is that that key 11.0, when, when Word launches for the first time and says, oh, I need to do this migration, I'm going to go looking for HK current user software Microsoft Office 11, that it merges that with what's on the local machine. And the end result is the sequenced version of Office 2010 can see the settings on the local machine for Office. And like in our diagram just here, it grabs them from the local file system, moves them into the app v package, and then saves them in the virtualized file system as Office 2010 settings. Hey, presto. So, how does that all look in reality? Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing it up. It was horrible of me to miss that. So the, the point that this gentleman has made is that a lot of the time you'll be doing this migration at the same time as a Windows 7 upgrade. So I'm going to assume that you're going to use USMT4 to migrate settings for other applications. So what you can do is you can use, um, you can use USMT4 to move all of your um, Office 2003 settings over into the new profile. The machine ends up on Windows 7, USMT puts all the Office 2003 settings back in there, and then this process comes along, grabs them out, and puts them into the AppV package. So yeah, that's a very valid point. Well, one of the big roadblocks that we were running into is we had, to, um, we, we had a scripted solution where um, the new computer would ask um, the old computer name, and it would go to the share drive and get the profiles and, and put them on there before the user wants to for the first time. Yeah. But if the techs that were doing the swap didn't do that, um, like a lot of their settings And so, and if you had a scenario like that, this is pretty flexible to solve that because what you can do is you can just reset that user's Office 2010 at V installation. So put them back to the sequence state and then fix your USMT, whatever your tech had to do, and then launch Word again, the process will take off again. So yeah, you could get around that. Um, and so to see how that all looks, All right, here's a machine that I prepared earlier. Your scenario that you're talking about, Windows 7, we have Office 2003 installed. And what I'll do is I'm going to jump in and I'm going to change a couple of settings in Office 2003 just to show you that this works real time. All right, so for example, let's change this to something else. Just to prove that I'm not making it up, Someone picked for me something out of the list there that I should change it to. Web page filtered. Web page filtered. Okay. Let's hope that it still exists in Office 2010. Web page filtered. So we save that, close it, and now, so this Office 2010 here, you'll see in a second, is actually an AppV package that was created using the package that I was just editing a second ago. I've just jumped ahead while you weren't looking and done it. You can see there in the right corner, it's launched it up using AppV. And it's not licensed because I don't have a KMS key active on this host. And have a look at that. You can see there pretty clearly that it's grabbed the setting and, um, and, and migrated across. And so to demonstrate what you were saying before, oh, I just realized that the text didn't copy all of my profile back down onto the machine before doing that. To get around that problem, it would be as easy as closing this app v application. Hit shut down. Good. It's now idle. Right click on this, hit repair. That's now going to delete all the state out of it. Now if we open 2003 up, and change the default save, say, to XML, and close it, and then run that again. Whoop. You'll see it's changed it to XML format now. 
that's how that hangs together. See how we're going for time. All right. Does anyone know what time this session finishes? Three minutes. Three minutes. I didn't even see the signs up there. All right. So the last piece that I had um, was one around uh, just looking at some deployment options and how to push out custom um, registry files and settings um, <coughs> during your office deployment. Um, something that's come, I'll try and just squeeze it into two minutes really. Something that's come up a lot in the past is, hey, I've got these add-ins that I need to register and I need to put the registry keys in for Office, but they're in the HKEY current user hive and so every time a new user logs on, those files and settings aren't there. So I just wanted to call out a, a, a piece of functionality that you can use to, um, <coughs> to solve that problem. Sorry? Group policy preferences is probably a very good solution. The only gotcha is that what if those settings don't get there or get overwritten by the time your people get there? So for this, what we do is we can bake them into the Office customization tool and then they end up in everyone's um, local user profile. <coughs> so really quickly, I'll slam through it. It's a pretty easy one. All we need to do is we go into um, into, into regedit. We, if we go into the local machine hive under software, Microsoft, Office uh, 14 user settings, you'll see there's already a whole bunch of stuff here that has been set up. So if we add, I haven't actually done this in a while, I should probably remember how to do it. If we add a new key and call it, hi James, hi James. So we go in there and actually, oh, there's one that we've already done there. All right. So we take that, we add a new 32-bit D-word, count, set it to one. And then under that, we need to create another folder here called create. And then folders that represent all of the, uh, the locations where you want to change those settings. So to give you a bit of an idea as to how that string needs to look, Basically, you have, say, say you want to move a key, H key local machine, you go into the user settings, you create a new one where FT settings is just an arbitrary name, whatever you want to call it. You need to put in there a D word that's set to a value of one. You have the action there, that's either create or delete, um, or you can use create file and delete file to do files as well. But basically for registry, it's create or delete. And then I want to create a key called HK Current User Software Microsoft Office 14 Word Status Bar. And then I want to put all the different status bar settings in there. And then how that comes together. If we take all of that, I might actually just, that's, I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to set this count here to a value of two, because it's going to do the same thing. And then, if I open up Word, yep, and then close Word again, if we jump into the HKEY current user hive, and then go into software, Microsoft, Office, 14, uh, I've got to remember where they were now, Word, Status bar, you can see that all the settings that we've created are there. Just to prove that I'm not pulling your leg, if we delete them all, go back down to the bottom here into HK Local Machine, and change this count to something else, say three, and then go back up here, open Word, close it, Oh look, they all came back. So there you go. So sorry to have to cut that one short. It's probably a, a bit close on the timing, but that's a really easy way that you can push custom files and registry settings from your HKEY local machine hive, which is something that you can push them to using the Office customization tool at deploy time and move them out into everyone's HKEY current user or user profile in the case of files um, to, to move those settings out there uh, uh, 
without much hassle at all. So really, to wrap up, the, the biggest piece of advice that I can give you is don't rely on any of the tools that you've seen here today to go and make your office deployments happen. Think of what the questions you need answered to move forward are. How many people do I need? What needs to be solved now? What can we put off until later? Find the tools that you need to answer those questions and those questions only, and then get out there and start deploying because you'll find that once you start pushing everything out, the rest of it falls into place pretty well. I hope you took something away from this session 